Turn to Numbers 23. I'm going to talk to you this morning about Satan's strategy. The Bible talks about the doctrine of Balaam. What is the doctrine of Balaam? Revelation 2.14, But I have a few things against thee. The Lord is writing to one of the seven churches of Asia. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So, what does he mean, the doctrine of Balaam? Well, Balaam was a very great figure in the Old Testament. Obviously, the man was a prophet. Uh, I think he gets a bad rap because he had a bad finish to a good start. Okay? But there was a day when he was a very godly man. Uh, what he prophesied came to pass. He spoke God's word. And he was faithful to only speak God's word. Uh, we see in chapter 22... That the king of Moab sees the children of Israel coming out of Egypt spread out in the valley there, and he says, These are these people are too powerful for me. I can't conquer this people. But I'm gonna go and I'm gonna call Balaam, and I know that if Balaam will come and curse these people, then I can overcome them. Because the ones whom Balaam curses are cursed, and the one whom Balaam blesses are blessed. So he sends his men to Balaam and says, look, I'm going to give you all kinds of riches and rewards and honor. I need you to come and curse these people for me because they're too powerful for me and I, I've got to overcome them and I can't overcome them unless you come and curse them. Well, we know the story how Balaam first said, he went and talked to God. God said, no. So he told the guys, leave. I don't care if you give me a whole house full of gold. I'm not going against the word of the Lord. Well, then they went back to Balak and Balak said, look, Go, you go tell him he's got to come. Okay? He's got to come. And we'll give him this and this and something else. And so the, the men went back. And they were making Balaam some grand offers. And Balaam said, I, I've got to do what the Lord tells me to do. So he went and talked to the Lord. And the Lord said, If the men come and call for you in the morning, go ahead and go with them. But only speak what I tell you. So it says the next morning, Balaam jumped up, saddled his donkey, and was ready to go. And God was angry when he saw how, how happy he was, knowing that what these men were asking him to do was not right, was not what God wanted done, but he loved the wages of unrighteousness, the Bible says in, in Jude. He loved the reward, okay? And so he just jumped over that little if that God gave him, that little criteria, that little condition there, and he was ready to go, and on the path, an angel met him, and would have, was going to slay him. And the donkey saw it, God allowed the donkey to see the angel, and made a fool out of Balaam, and then allowed the donkey to speak, and uh, next thing you know, Balaam's talking to his donkey. So, uh, he finally shows up, he had tells the Lord, look, I'll go back if you want me to go back. And God said, no, you go ahead and go. But you only tell what I say for you to tell them. Okay, so he goes on. Chapter 23. <clears throat> and Balaam said unto Balak, build me here seven altars and prepare me here seven oxen and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had spoken. And Balak and Balaam offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. And Balaam said unto Balak, stand by thy burnt offering and I will go. Peradventure the Lord will come to meet me, and whatsoever he showeth me, I will tell thee. And he went to an high place. So they thought, you know, if we have seven altars and seven rams, we're going to bribe God. <coughs> Balaam knew that God did not want to curse Israel. But if we offer enough incense and enough sacrifice, then maybe he'll do what we want him to do. That's why a lot of people look at prayer. You know, they go to church and they put some money in the offering plate because after all, if I really need him, I, I want him to work for me. <coughs> So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep him happy so he'll do what I want him to do. And God God is not does not work under those conditions. 
Verse 4, And God met Balaam, and he said unto him, I have prepared seven altars, and I have offered upon every altar a bullock and a ram. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth, and said, Return unto Balak, and thus thou shalt speak. And he returned unto him, and lo, he stood by his burnt sacrifice, he and all the princes of Moab. Now understand, Balaam is going to greatly disappoint this crowd. Uh, look, look at Balaam's fortitude. And realize that, that you know, we, we say, oh, you know, I, I'd never be a Balaam. Well, Balaam did some very great things before he messed up. So, you need to ask yourself, have I ever been as great as Balaam was when he was great? No. Okay, so what are the, what are the chances that I could blow it like Balaam blew it? Well, they're there, aren't they? So he goes back, Balak the king, and all the princes are standing there. And he took up this parable and said, verse 7, Balak the king of Moab hath brought me from Aram out of the country of the east, saying, Come, curse me Jacob, and come, defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? How shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob in the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. And Balak said unto Balaam, What hast thou done unto me? I took thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast blessed them altogether. And he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord hath put in my mouth? And Balak said unto him, Come, I pray thee, with me unto another place, from whence thou mayest see them. Thou shalt see but the uttermost, the utmost part of them, and shalt not see them all. And curse me them from thence. Let's get a different view of these people, so we can curse them. Just, you just need a better perspective. And he brought him into the field of Zophim, to the top of Pisgah, and built seven altars, and offered him a bullock and a ram on every altar. That's quite a bit of work. And he said unto Balak, Stand here by thy burnt offerings, while I meet the Lord yonder. And the Lord met Balaam, and put a word in his mouth, and said, Go again unto Balak, and say thus. And when he came to him, behold, he stood by his burnt offering, and the princes of Moab with him. And Balak said unto him, What hath the Lord spoken? And he took up his parable, and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear, hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall not he do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall, not, shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot re reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with the Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it should be said of Jacob and of Israel, What hath God wrought? Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion, and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey, and drink the blood of the slain. And Balak said unto ba Balaam, Neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. But Balaam answered and said unto Balak, Told not I thee, saying, All that the Lord speaketh, that I must do? And Balak said unto Balaam, Come, I pray thee, I will bring thee into another place. Peradventure it will please God, that thou mayest curse me them from thence. And Balak brought Balaam unto the top of Peor, that looketh toward Jeshimon. And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me here seven altars, and prepare me here seven bullocks and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had said, and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. And when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not, as at other times, to seek for enchantments, but he set his face toward the wilderness. And Balaam lifted up his eyes, and he saw Israel abiding in his tents according to their tribes. And the Spirit of God came upon him. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam the son of Beor hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, he hath said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel! As the valleys are they spread forth, as gardens by the riverside, as the trees of lane aloes, which the Lord hath planted, and as cedar trees beside the waters. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brought him forth out of Egypt, he hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. <coughs> He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, 
and shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. He coucheth, he lay down as a lion and as a great lion, who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blesseth thee, and cursed is he that curseth thee. And Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, and he smote his hands together. And Balak said unto Balaam, I called thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. Therefore now flee thou to thy place. I thought to promote thee unto great honor, but lo, the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. And Balaam said unto Balak, Spake I not also to thy messengers, which thou sentest unto me, saying, If Balak would give me his whole house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of mine own mind. But what the Lord saith, that, I, that will I speak. And now behold, I go unto my people, come thou art for, and I will advertise thee what this people should do to thy people in the latter days. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam the son of Beor hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, he has said which heard the words of God and knew the knew uh, <coughs> knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance and having his eyes open. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Seth. And Edom shall be a possession, and Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion, and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. And when he looked at Amalek, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. And he goes on down, and then it says in verse 25, And Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place, and Balak also went his way. In the very next chapter, we find that the children of Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And the daughters of Moab called the Israelites to their sacrifices, and Israel started uh, going after them. They, you know, all these pretty Moabite and Midianite girls were inviting them to come to their church and come to their sacrifices, and they began going there. And of course, the, Midian, the Midianite Moabite religion is all about sensuality, love. Okay, but love that leads to fornication, love that leads to impropriety, love that breaks down standards of holiness, love, love, and grace that allows you to do that which God has commanded you not to do. And so they, they fall into this trap. And God brings a curse, a plague, upon them. And 24,000 people die. A thousand of them die because God commanded uh, certain ones to be put to death, and 23,000 died because of a plague. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, 8, Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and 20,000. In Numbers it says 24,000 because it includes uh, another group that didn't die just from the plague. Okay, what happened here? Balaam, a prophet of renown, was hired to bring God's curse upon Israel, but God cannot be bought or manipulated. And so Balaam could not curse Israel, and thus could not obtain the riches and rewards offered to him. Balaam, by understanding God's justice, counsels the Midianites. He said, look, back here he said, I have found no iniquity in Israel. There's no just reason or right reason to curse them. They're, they're, they're living godly. God is pleased with them, and so He's not going to curse them just because you offer bullets on the altar. But come here. If Israel were to start entering into your idolatry, if you could seduce them away from holiness, if you could encourage them to drop their standards, if you can lead them away from God's commandments, God will curse them. He's a just God. There's no respect to persons. He's not blessing Israel because He's partial. He's an impartial judge. So, if you lead them into sin, God will curse them. Ah, so, Balak... It says, Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. And thus, God's anger would be kindled against them, and God Himself would turn on them. 
Because he, there is no respect to persons with God. You can be His beloved. You can be uh, the preacher's kid. You can be the missionary's kid. You can be of a certain church group. But you start eating things that are prepared for idols, which a lot of things would fit in that category, eating things that are offered to idols. So this, this whether it be meat or music or clothes or attitudes or language or whatever it be, if this was prepared by the ungodly to serve their gods and you partake of it, you're eating meat offered to idols. You are partaking of something that was prepared by the ungodly to serve their idols. Right. Okay? And when you start partaking of it, you're entering into their idolatry. We understand that idolatry is not just statues or, or in a grove of trees. We understand that idolatry has to do with worshiping something, putting something above God. The, the gift above the giver. The creature above the creator. We understand that is idolatrous. The Bible says a man that is covetous is idolatrous. Okay? So, you enter into his covetousness, you enter into his idolatry. Right? Doesn't, you don't have to stretch anything to make that work. It, it's what the Bible teaches. So, he said, look, God is just and no respecter of persons. He's not going to curse these people. They are, at this point, they are invincible. They're under the shadow of God's wing. They're pleasing God. And, yeah, they're invincible. They're going to conquer. They've got the strength and power of God behind them. But, all you have to do, you don't have to conquer them. All you have to do is seduce them. Get them away from God. Get them into something that God doesn't want. Draw them away from His commandments and God will squash them all by Himself and you won't have to worry about it. Balaam was a pretty shrewd fellow. Balak called all the Moabitish, Midianitish people together and talked. He probably gathered out all the pretty ones, all the, the women, and said, look, this, this is to save the nation, okay? Go start inviting those young Israelite boys to church. Go start inviting those young Israelite boys to the, the feast we're going to have. We're going to have a festival. We're going to have a feast, okay? We're going to have uh, an idolatrous feast. Like, in their mind, this is our religion, okay? This, this is our religion. you got to respect our religion, right? We should respect one another's beliefs, of course. So, uh, you Israelites, you know, we... You're so wonderful. We just know you love God. And we want to invite you to come to our feast. We're having a feast for the Lord. Sound like what Aaron did with the golden calves. We're having a feast unto the Lord. We want you to be a part of it. So that's what happened. And God was angry and he sent a plague. God killed 23,000 Israelites in one day. And Moses and the leaders killed another thousand at least. Godly leaders stood up and stopped what was going on. In doing so, there had to be bloodshed. There had to be people executed. God commanded it. They judged the wicked and saved the nation by bringing them back into God's favor. They could not bring that nation back into God's favor without separating the wicked out. Okay? Then God commands Moses to avenge the nation upon Midian and Balaam is slain in that. Now, When they're in Numbers 31, they go, they go to war and they, they wipe out the Midianites and the Moabites and they bring back the cattle and all the women. They kill all the, the men, okay, the men of war. And Moses was angry with them. He said, Behold, these, the women, caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of pure. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. So these people spare all the women, and Moses said, look, this, these are the ones, through the counsel of Balaam, that caused the problem. Obviously, Balak was the one who 
asked them to do that and led them to do that. Now, we see here a scenario. Who do you think taught Balaam his doctrine? Who, who did the very same thing in the Garden of Eden when he wanted to be Lord of the earth, the God of this world, all these kingdoms of the world, they're delivered to me. How'd that happen? He seduced Eve and thereby seduced Adam, the one who had the authority and the jurisdiction, and he stole it. Okay? <coughs> That's why the second Adam came back and took it back, which was Christ. Did I say the second Adam? Yeah. Make sure I didn't say something there wrong. In Deuteronomy 28, okay, after all this happens, Moses warns the nation of Israel. And he's talking about the blessings and the cursings. And then during, after the cursings, he said, Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things, Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and nakedness and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck. Now this is talking about what's going to happen. So it said, you can serve the Lord. You can be thankful. You can be graceful. You can be obedient. And God will bless you and you'll have everything you need. If that's not good enough for you and you can't serve the Lord in gladness of heart, then you'll serve your enemies and want everything. <coughs> the devil's listening. What we find after this in later years, Isaiah 29, 13 says, Whereas, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near to me with their mouth and with their lips do they honor me, but they have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by precept of men and not practiced from the heart. Therefore behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. What happens is this. You've got a people blessed of God. They become lukewarm. They lose the wisdom of walking with God because God withdraws that wisdom. God withdraws the wisdom of the wise, and people began to be foolish. They began to be surface. They began to be flaky and, and silly in their thinking and their logic and their decision making. And they, they offend God and they wander away from God. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 9. Now, Nehemiah, the Old Testament's not arranged chronologically. Nehemiah, uh, what he's saying here happened many years after Isaiah's life. Isaiah was dead and gone. Jeremiah came and went. The people were carried into Babylon for 70 years. Now they're brought back from Babylon after 70 year captivity. And in chapter 9, they're praying and trying to get back right with God. They're trying to get back in God's favor because they've been serving their enemies for 70 years. Okay? They were a people blessed of God. Satan did the Balaam thing. He lured them away from God. God destroyed them, carried them away because they weren't willing to serve the Lord with a glad heart. They weren't willing to serve the Lord with gratitude. He said, you can go serve the Babylonians and the Persians. Well, then they've come back after 70 years of that. And in Nehemiah 9, verse 24. <coughs> so the children went in and possessed the land. And thou subduest before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gavest them into their hands with their kings and the people of the land, that they might do with them as they would. And they took strong cities and fat land and possessed houses full of all goods, well digged, vineyards and olive yards and fruit trees in abundance. So, so they did eat and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in thy great goodness. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee and cast thy law behind their backs and slew thy prophets which testified against them to turn them to thee. And they wrought great provocations. 
Therefore thou deliverest them into the hand of their enemies, who vexed them. And in the time of their troubles, when they cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven. And according to thy manifold mercies, thou gavest them saviors, who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they did evil again before thee. Therefore leftest thou them in the hand of their enemies, so that they had the dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven. And many times didst thou deliver them according to thy mercies, and testified against them, that thou mightest bring them again unto thy law. Yet they dealt proudly, and hearkened not unto thy commandments, but sinned against thy judgments, which if a man knew, he shall live in them. And withdrew the shoulder, and hardened the neck, and would not hear. Yet many years didst thou forbear them, and testified against them by the Spirit and thy prophets. Yet would they not give ear. Therefore gavest thou them into the land, the hand of the people of the lands. Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, thou didst not utterly consume them, nor forsake them, for thou art a gracious and merciful God. <clears throat> now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, the terrible God, who keepeth covenant and mercy, let not all the trouble seem little before thee that hath come upon us, on our kings, on our princes, on our priests, and on our prophets, and on our fathers, and on all thy people since the time of the kings of Assyria unto this day. Howbeit thou art just in all that is brought upon us, for thou hast done right, but we have done wickedly. Neither have our kings, our princes, our priests, nor our fathers kept thy law, nor hearkened unto thy commandments and thy testimonies, wherewith thou didst testify against them. For they have not served thee in their kingdom and in thy great goodness that thou gavest them, and in the large and fat land which thou gavest before them. Neither turned they from their wicked works. Behold, we are servants this day, and for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. And it yieldeth much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also, they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle. At their pleasure, we are in great distress. And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it. And our princes, Levites, and priests seal or sign unto it. So, does anybody know how to learn from history? Satan knows all this. Satan can read the Bible. He knows. Okay? Let me read you something here. God, God brought fleeing, persecuted Christians to America. They didn't all believe the same, but they all were fleeing persecution, seeking religious liberty to train their children up in the ways of the Lord, according to the Bible, in religious liberty. They fled across the ocean to America. They established a land with religious liberty. No country has sent out more missionaries, more tracts, more Bibles, and helped Christians around the world more than America. Do you think Satan likes that? No, he does not. Look what happened to the Christian nations in Europe where the Bible, where Christianity began. The Galatians, the seven churches of Asia. Okay? Now it's, it's Turkey. It's controlled by Muslims. It's controlled by people who don't care about Christian liberties. All over the Roman Empire, the places where there used to be Christianity is oftentimes either Muslim or communist. The devil does not like our nation. Joseph Stalin in 1935 said this, If we can enslave just one generation in any country, that country will fall to Soviet communism. The way to enslave that generation is by means of immorality, music, and drugs. <clears throat> he been talking to Balaam? Why immorality? Why music and drugs? Because when you break down the moral fiber of a nation, liberty falls. Our forefathers knew that the Judeo-Christian ethic had to be in place for there to be pro proper uh, liberty and freedom for the people. A people that is lawless must have oppressive laws to control them. The more lawless a people becomes, the more laws they need. 
the more, the more you can self-govern, the more you can control yourself, the more liberty you get. Just go ask mom and dad, you know? The, the, the kid who, uh, the child who is obedient and honoring and, and, obe and, and can control himself can be trusted. The one who is always testing the laws and pushing the lines needs more laws, needs more lines. It's just the way it works. Lenin said in 1921, how to destroy the West. Corrupt the young. Get them away from religion. Encourage their interest in sex. Make them superficial by focusing their interest in sports, sensual entertainments, and trivialities. Always preach true democracies, but seize power as fast and ruthlessly as possible. Encourage government extravagance. Destroy its credit. Produce fear with rising prices, inflation, and general discontent. Encourage disorders and foster a lenient attitude toward disorders. Side with the, side with the thugs. By specious argument, cause the breakdown of the old moral virtues. Honesty, sobriety, and self-restraint. Cause registration of firearms to leave the population defenseless. He was a shrewd leader. Sounds like the doctrine of Balaam, doesn't it? In uh, Richard Wormbrandt's book, he says this, and he, he's one who experienced, he was there. He said, satanic forces prepared Russia for the victory of Marxism. Now, Russia didn't fall to Soviet communism and basic slavery while they were a vibrant Christian nation. That doesn't happen. No, just like Israel. Israel could not be cursed of God and brought under its enemies while it was walking with God. Right? So there had to be the doctrine of Balaam going on. Lure them away from God, corrupt their morals, get them into... Uh, vanity and immorality and foolishness and superficiality and then the moral fiber will be gone and they will fall under the hand of oppression okay here's what he says satanic forces prepared Russia for the victory of Marxism the time of the revolution was a period when love goodwill and healthy feeling were considered mean or low and retrograde or backward low and backward you know out of, out of style hey I went to public school about 40 years ago this was already well in place in my public school you didn't talk about being godly honorable obe obeying your parents that would that would all be <laughs> you obey your parents it says here girls hid their innocence and husbands their faithfulness. Destruction was praised as good taste. Neurasthenia, which is depression or anxiety, as a sign of a fine mind. This was the theme of new writers who burst on the scenes out of obscurity. Men invented vices and perversions and were fastidious in their avoidance of being thought moral. After all, a macho man can't be thought to be moral. Oh, you a good boy? You just being a good boy? They mock and scorn. Oh, you obey mommy and daddy. Oh, you go to church. You're a church boy. Yeah. And so if you want to be tough and cool, no. I don't obey mom and dad. I'm rebellious. I'm immoral. No, I'm, you know, afraid. 40 years ago in public schools, a girl would be shamed. Everybody... People ask her out in front of everybody, oh, are you still a virgin? It was, it was a shameful thing if she was. Yeah, this is where our society was 40 years ago. I can testify. Okay? Now, Russia was prepared by rotten religion, rotting morals, decay of... True Christianity. It was prepared. 
1889 to 1882. Darwin. 1818 to 1883. Who's this? Karl Marx. 1817 to 1924. This is Bolshevik Revolution. And this is Stalin. The greatest mass murderer that's ever lived. Now, Darwin laid the foundation for the God-haters, though he may not have intended to lay a foundation for God-haters. Some say one thing, some say another. But he laid the foundation nonetheless. In uh, in page 85, i got it written down here, Wurmbrand says, How was it that Stalin became a revolutionist after reading Darwin? As a student in an orthodox seminary, he obtained from Darwin the concept that we are not creatures of God, but the result of an evolution in which ruthless competition reigns. It is only the strongest and most cruel who survive. He learned that moral and religious criteria play no role in nature, and that man is as much a part of nature as a fish or an ape. Long live ruthlessness and cruelty. The end result of Darwin's theory has been the killing of tens of thousands of innocents. He therefore became the spiritual father of the greatest mass murderer in history. Historians attribute approximately 20 million deaths to Stalin's terrorism in his own country. Hmm. Vladimir Lenin. In late 1893, Lenin moved to St. Petersburg. There he worked as a barrister's assistant, a lawyer's assistant and rose to a senior position in a Marxist revolutionary cell that called itself the, quote, Social Democrats, after the Marxist Social Democrat Party of Germany. Listen to some of Lenin's quotes. The goal of socialism is communism. Our program necessarily includes the propaganda of atheism. If for the sake of communism, it is necessary for us to destroy nine-tenths of the people, we must not hesitate. The more representatives of the reactionary clergy we shoot, the better. The dictatorship, and take this into account once and for all, means unrestricted power based on force, not on law. That's this guy right here. He was the leader, he was a friend of Marx, a follower of Marx, leader in the Bolshevik Revolution, which happened between March and November 1917. Now listen again, listen again what Wormbrandt says. Satanic forces prepared Russia for the victory of Marxism. There is a lot of evidence that Lenin hated Russians. Okay? Obviously, Stalin was a, an avid disciple of Lenin and killed 20 million of them and the, the close-by countries that the USSR had power over and, and conquered. But before, before all this could happen, there had to be a satanic ferment, a satanic rotting in society before a society would ever fall for such a, a thing as this. In Jeremiah 8.8, 8, how do ye say ye are wise, and the law of the Lord is with us? Lo, certainly in vain made he it, and the pen of the scribes is in vain. The wise men are ashamed, they are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord, and what wisdom is in them? Therefore will I give their wives unto others, and their fields to them that shall inherit them. For every one from the least, even unto the greatest, is given to covetousness. From the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall, and in the time of their visitation shall they 
be cast down, saith the Lord. This was said prior to Israel being carried away captive. Captive. The salt had lost its savor. Do you remember what Jesus said about salt that loses its savor? Matthew 5, 13. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. When the church becomes rotten, when Christianity becomes rotten in a society, it produces atheists. That man went to seminary. That man went to seminary. This man went to seminary. This man was raised by a lukewarm Lutheran. Their parents were Christians. You read some of the writings of Karl Marx as a young man. He wrote poems. Love to Christ. He was a professing Christian at one time. Darwin was a professing Christian at one time. But religion becomes rotten. It produces God-haters. I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the, do the doctrine of Balaam. This causes the ferment. Okay? This causes the, the rotting. When you tolerate in the church, there are people in the church, whether they understand it or not, whether they think it or not, whether they plan it or not, it's called the doctrine of Balaam. Okay? They began to be the uh, catalyst. They began to be the pawn on the chessboard who begins to help the Christianity to rot. Hypocrisy, covetousness, the blush is gone. Being glad that you're a Christian, being grateful, serving God with gladness and gratefulness is gone. You go out in public and you don't, you don't want them to know that you're a Christian. You want them to think you're a cool dude. You don't want them to know you're a servant of Jesus Christ. You don't want them to know that you honor mother and father. You don't want them to know that you obey the church. That's belittling. That's low. That's, that's mean. Low. And retrograde. You don't want them to know that you're pure. And you've never dated. You don't want them to know that you believe in hands-off courtship. And faithfulness in marriage. Oh, that makes you look a little retarded in this society. Man, you're backward. Catch up to the times. Right? Yeah, that's where Russia was before they fell into what Marx called a holocaust. People say, well, who is worse, worse Hitler or Stalin? <coughs> Stalin killed way more people. Hitler focused on a certain ethnic background, genocide. They were both mass murderers. They both loved the same philosophers. They both started in... Christian circles and became Marxist. You just put on different clothes, is all. Fascism or communism, socialism, it all ends up in the same place. It ends up in atheism. So, what does the doctrine of Balaam accomplish? A nation with God's blessing is led to a position of God's cursing. George Washington said this, The propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. James Madison, the father of our Constitution, as he's called, says religion is the basis and foundation of government. We have staked the whole future of American civilization not upon the power of government, far from it, we have staked the future of all of our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government, upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to control ourselves, 
to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. When that goes, freedom goes. When that goes, your liberties go. When that goes, despotism, communism, fascism, basically tyranny and slavery come in. Thomas Jefferson said, God who gave us life gave us liberty. Can, can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? No. You remove God out of the equation and you end up with communistic atheism. Second Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 11.1 Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. <coughs> the doctrine of Balaam. Right? Same thing. So your mind <coughs> should be corrupted from the purity <coughs> that is in Christ. <coughs> For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And then he goes on to say in verse 13, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. 2 Timothy 4, 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. And what happens then? You have rotting Christianity. You have churches that have turned to fables. Another Jesus. Another gospel. Another spirit. You have the robbing of the salt of its savor. And God's blessing. Then you have lost wisdom. You have rotten, savorless religion. Then you have rejection of religion. You have atheism coming in. The salt is cast out. You have the expansion of wickedness. The reaction to the hypocrisy and fables of a rotten religion. Then you have socialism, communism, and atheism. Loss of liberty, especially Christian liberty. Then you have Christians cast out and trodden under foot of men. History has proven this over and over. In the Old Testament with Israel, okay, all the way back to the garden, it's the same plan. When you are right with God, when you're walking with God, when you're grateful and thankful and happy and, and, and you love God's law and you're in the spirit of Psalm 119, the devil can't get you. He knows it. Your enemies can't conquer you. But he also knows the key. The key he whispered in Balaam's ear. Man, you're missing out on a lot of honor and money you're missing out on a lot, buddy. God's not going to curse this people, but I know the secret. Come here. Come here, Bailey. You get all your pretty girls. You throw a feast. Tell them it's, tell them it's religious. This is a feast to God. Gather all the pretty ones and have them go invite those Israelite boys to come to church. It worked. It works every time. When has it not worked? Well, when individuals like Joseph fled, God brought him to power regardless of the accusations. But he almost blew it. Satan's strategy works anytime he can lure the little chick out from under the hen's wing. Oh, you don't, you don't need to hide under your mama's wing. Come here. Be a big chick. Be a tough chick. You don't need to hide under your mama's wing. Come here. It's, it's not cool to be godly. It's not cool to be obedient. It's not cool to honor authority. Come here. You don't wanna you don't wanna be under that. You might want to check the window of the office. 
<clears throat> Make sure it's not coming in. Are you listening to me this morning? Let me read you again in closing. Vladimir Lenin, How to Destroy the West. He was a, a disciple of Marx, a friend of Marx. He knew Marx, okay? He liked Darwin. Was he just somebody who really cared for the poor and tried to help the poor? Makes a nice speech, doesn't it? Makes a nice speech. What did he do? What did he do? That's what counts. What did his disciples do? We know what Jesus' disciples did. What did Lenin's disciple do? What did Lenin do? How to destroy the West. When he looked at the West, he saw a formidable foe. Christians. George Washington said, the difference between an American Christian and every other person on the planet is that they would rather die standing than live on their knees. In other words, in slavery. What he's talking about. They would rather die for liberty than live in slavery. So Lenin, he looked, he said, this is a people, a noble people, a people who believe in God, a people who honor the word of God, they honor the Bible. They're a threat. How do we destroy the West? The Christians in communist prisons and dungeons, the underground church, they are banking on America's help sending Bibles, smuggling Bibles, smuggling money and supplies. They need the West. They, they, they depend on the West. When we have a good administration in the West who puts pressure on them for their civil rights abuses, it helps the Christians in the underground church. They need that. They depend on it. They pray for it. The devil doesn't like that. How do we destroy the West? Corrupt the young. Get them away from religion. Encourage their interest in sex. Make them superficial by focusing their interest in sports, sensual entertainments, and trivialities. Always preach true democracies, but seize power as fast and ruthlessly as possible. Encourage government extravagance. Destroy its credit. Produce fear with rising prices, inflation, and general discontent. Encourage disorders and foster a lenient attitude towards disorders. By specious argument, cause the breakdown of the old moral virtues, honesty, sobriety, and self-restraint. Cause registration of firearms to leave the population defenseless. Well, we know they've been working on it at least since 1921 when Lenin said that. They've made quite a bit of progress, have they not? How many, how many generations before your grandchildren, your children, your grandchildren come under communistic, socialistic, atheism? You need to maybe read some of the stories of what people went through under, under these guys and are still going through under some of the same. You say, Brother Mark, what can we do? Tell those little Moabites to go home. Tell those Midianite girls to get off your property. Tell them that you're pure and you like it. You serve God and you love His law. You're not ashamed of being godly. You're not ashamed of honoring parents. You're not ashamed of loving the old hymns and not the country western rock and roll. Yes, you go to church. Yes, you're a church boy. And you're thankful for it. And you love God. And you love His Word. And you believe there's going to be a judgment day. And you're not ashamed to say so. And you dress modestly. And your wife is modest. And you're a faithful husband. And you're a faithful son. And you're a faithful daughter. Quit being embarrassed as a Christian. Quit thinking that it's not loving. We, we don't want to shun those little Moabites over there. We ought, to, we ought to go to their church and at least show them that we love them. 
Yeah, the devil's saying amen to that. Oh, we got to show him love. No, you need to stand up for what's right. You need to be more concerned about God being pleased amen. than about everybody else being pleased. Right. You need to be more concerned about God not cursing you. You want God's blessing. And whatever it takes to stay under that blessing for your own good is what you need to do. Right. What I have told you this morning, I can prove with one history lesson after another. Over and over and over. I'm 52 years old. America may not crash before I'm gone. If the Lord tarries though, what about your children and grandchildren? A revival of religion. A revival of godliness. A revival of the fear of God. A revival of truth and righteousness is the only hope for this nation in which you live. It's the only hope to keep your grandchildren from living under the conditions that the Russians have experienced ever since communism came to power. We need to get serious because there are forces working hard, hard to take away our Christian liberties. They're making great strides. Then what? Then what? Then what nation's going to smuggle Bibles to us? Then what nation is going to put pressure on us, our country, to get us out of prison? What nation is there going to be that we can look to for hope to help us in our dire need? There's not going to be any other Americas around. Let's stand together. <coughs> I would encourage you. <laughs> I read uh, Wormbrand's book many years ago, and I've, I've read. I in reading through them again recently. I preached his last three sermons on that topic because it's something that's very important and relevant to us now today. We've got a president in there right now who is standing for our constitution, making a lot of good moves. Okay. But what happens when the pendulum swings? Where are we going to be? The pendulum almost always swings. We need to be people of integrity, prayer. We need to be salt. We don't need to be listening to the Moabite music and, and oh, I want to go over there. I want to see what they're doing. Oh, they seem so nice. We don't need to be stupid, guys. Right. We need to wake up. You read about these Christians under communism. They endured incredible sacrifices to be faithful. Can we be faithful when we have it so easy? Can we be faithful? What does it take? What, Richard Wormbrandt, I think it was three years in solitary confinement. You know a little room, I think it was 12 foot underground. Read what that man went through and kept his sanity and his love for God. Incredible. Unthinkable. Scary. Scary when you read what atheists did. They, they said to the Christians, if we just kill you, you'll go to heaven. We don't want you to go to heaven. We want you to die blaspheming God and go to hell. And they did everything they could to get them to blaspheme God before they killed them. Do you want your great grandchildren faith? The same philosophies that made Lenin and Stalin and the Bolshevik Revolution, the same philosophies, Marx and Darwin, they're being preached in our universities and schools continually. It was those philosophies. And they'll do it again. 
Recently, they just had a crackdown on Christians in China. See what's going on. No, don't, don't read the newspaper. Don't read what the Chinese tell you. Check with the underground church sources and find out what's really happening in Russia and China. Okay? Find out what's really happening with the true Christians in these nations. We can have all the guns and bombs we want. But when the doctrine of Balaam kicks in, it's not going to do any good. It's the blessing of God is our only hope. That's right. And the only hope of this nation maintaining the blessing of God is the saltiness of God's children. Any thoughts before we pray? This is serious business. This is not something you can... You go home from church and say, Oh, I don't agree with the preacher. Where's your grandchildren going to be? Someday you'll be looking back and saying, Wow, Brother Mark was right. If the Lord tarries... Right, the thing is, there's nothing there's nothing that will prevent the day that where you could justify not agreeing with. The, the, you were talking about uh, two totally different things. I wouldn't even call them apples and oranges. Those are both fruit. These are totally different uh, categories, right and wrong. And there, there's many of those black and white things here in our society. And we've got to choose right. And we can't try to try to meet the middle of the road somewhere or we're... we're Inevitably on the wrong side. Move on. Our only hope is to maintain God's favor, His smile. Let's you know, pray. I remember a story yeah. <clears throat> from a soldier fighting in the Pacific during World War II. And he talked about how some of his comrades died, and he said some of them. Yeah, they thought they got heaven waiting for them when they died. I had nothing, so I had to survive. But you know, the way Christians win is by loving not their life unto the death. They're willing to do anything, whatever it costs, to persevere, to hold out faithful, and to win. To come out on the right side with God. And when you are willing to do that, when Israel went down as a nation the religious <coughs> liberty went down we can't put our head in the sand and say oh well, God will take care of us God takes care of us through practical means God is taking care of us today because of foundation stones established by sacrificial men in the past. Pilgrims, Puritans, and you know the, the, the Christian peoples who came over and peopled this nation. The, the Christian influence, the revivalists, the Great Awakening. Okay? When, when uh, preachers and evangelists who've kept the conscience alive... It's our job to keep the national conscience alive. To pray for a revival of the fear of God. If we don't do that, then we are no better than those Israelites going over and worshiping with the Moabites and bringing destruction upon their people. We need to, we need to understand that. Yeah, think about when they got hauled off to Babylon, the... the Worship the God who commanded was then impossible because there was no temple and such things. There was opportunity for them to do the best they could in the situation they had, but it was not going to be like God had it originally in mind for them. Such would be the situation here as well. The Bible plainly tells us to pray for our leaders that we might lead a quiet and peaceful life. I was thinking too about the using the Midianites. Those were close relatives, weren't they? The Moabites were children of Lot. Yeah, so Midianites were children of Keturah. So I imagine they used that to help help their uh, 
craftiness. I mean, come on. Our four, we have the same forefathers. We serve the same God. We just do it a little bit different. But Let's be it, friends. It, it, We're cousins. Been, it's been doing. <laughs> we've been doing just great. It's not so bad. Come and see. I know. We we got to get smart. We can't we can't afford to be uh, simple. We've got to get smart. <laughs>